pray. Heavenly Father, we love you. We praise you. We thank you for that song, that choice by Bill to play that song as we enter into um, our time together in your word. It is the perfect song and puts our heart in the perfect place to hear today's word, which is a word uh, that I believe God will indeed impart faith into our hearts about what you can and what you will do in and through our lives. Even in the darkest places, how you can shine your light and you can come and you can touch us and you can bless us. Um, in the place where we uh, maybe are experiencing the greatest hopelessness today. I pray, dear God, I dedicate this message, dear God, uh, to those among us who are hopeless and fearful, uh, that are living in darkness, that think that you have forgotten about them, that think uh, that you can do something, but maybe you want. Maybe they've lost a sense that, that you will work and that you will move in their life. And so I dedicate this message to any of us, all of us, who need hope in our life in an area that is very specific. Uh, where we can't fix it. We've done as much as we can. The more we try, we, the more we seem to make it worse. I pray um, that you would touch us and that you would bless us in just that place and glorify yourself through it. It's in Jesus' name we say these prayers. Amen. Um, way, way back before uh, we had this pandemic and we also got into the teaching of the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapters 5 through 7, the deep teaching of Jesus uh, on the Sermon on the Mount, the principles, the laws, the ways of the kingdom of heaven. Wonderful, powerful teaching, great teaching. Um, but just before that time uh, in this series, and we're, by the way, in case you didn't know, we're resuming the Matthew series about the coming of the kingdom of heaven uh, today. Matthew chapter 8, verses 1 through 4, that is our text. Um, but before all of that, before the pandemic, which seemed to correlate with um, uh, the Sermon on the Mount and that being the major part of our teaching and our text at that time, we were, we were uh, studying the early parts of the book of Matthew and getting really excited about the potential that we saw in those scriptures for our ministry today. And what I mean by that is, first John the Baptist came uh, preaching, repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. And then Jesus took over that message and said, repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. Not only is it near it's actually here through King Jesus. It's already breaking in incrementally by grace through faith in the words uh, of God through faith in Jesus Christ. And so uh, it, it was the gospel, actually. It was good news uh, that the kingdom of heaven was near and that the kingdom of heaven was here because the coming of the kingdom of heaven in this era is meant to be for us and not against us. And so that was the overarching teaching. The kingdom of heaven is here. The kingdom of heaven is near. And now, now let me provide evidence of that. Signs and wonders following. Uh, that the power and authority of God is now here through the humble um, to show that God loves you and is not against you. In other words, God asserted his power through acts of loving kindness. It was evidence, the, the words and the truth of what Jesus was saying that he was teaching, that he was proclaiming was evidenced through signs and wonders primarily in the form of healing or supernatural miracles to help people. And so that's where we kind of were. And I was beginning to say some crazy things, and then the pandemic and the changing of teaching kind of shut it all down. I was beginning to say things like, I kind of think what we see here is what God wants to do among us. I don't actually think that he's done doing miracles. I actually think that Jesus set up the expectation that the things that we saw him doing, that we also would do an even greater. And, and I wonder if maybe we see less of the supernatural breaking in, one, because maybe it's happening and we don't have eyes to see it. We think maybe naturally things occurred or circumstantially things occurred, but if we don't peel back the spiritual scene and just see how involved God is in our life, I think that might be one of the things. The other thing is, maybe we just don't have faith or belief to receive the things that God wants to do in our life. Jesus, when he was in his own hometown, the Bible says he couldn't perform many miracles there because they didn't have much faith. So having faith in the words of God is essential to receiving power from God. And I don't think anywhere I read in Scripture there's any reason to expect that God won't continue to prove his words through power, through authority, uh, working out through us in acts of love and kindness. And so I was beginning to get onto that, and I was beginning to think about that. And then I was beginning to read about how um, Jesus would just go town to town, place to place with his disciples, and the crowds would follow him, and the crowds would find him. 
And I was thinking, man, what would that be like? Like, how cool would that be if, like, our church, like, we never knew where we were going to meet week to week, and we didn't have a marketing campaign, and we didn't have a website, and we didn't have any advertising, but people found us, and they found us because they wanted to find us, and the reason they wanted to find us is because there's actual power and authority. There's real, powerful, wonderful things happening among God's people And wherever they are, we've got to be. Where they are, Jesus is. They're the body of Christ. Therefore, Christ is among them. Two or more are gathered in his name. There he is also. There's not just powerful words that change our life, that change our mind, that bring us closer to God. There's powerful acts. And I began to think to myself, why do we have to work so hard to sell Jesus? Jesus never had to work that hard to sell himself. And I began to say crazy things like we shouldn't advertise. And I began to say crazy things like maybe we should like even make ourselves hard to find. What we should maybe focus on is being so close to God, so tuned into his spirit and his word, that his power will be made manifest among us. And I bet you if he did that among us, that 50 would become 100, would become 200, would become 400, more and more impact, more and more people, and the crowds would begin to follow us the same way they follow Jesus. I began to think crazy things like that, and I was really excited to explore that more. But then the pandemic happened, and we quit meeting, and then we moved into the depth of the teaching um, in chapters 5 through 7 was much more about the content, which was incredibly important and powerful, with major powerful implications. But I was looking forward to when we finished the Sermon on the Mount and moved on to where we are today, Matthew 8, because after chapter 7, after the words, um, we now move towards the miracles, the healings, the power of God that make evidence that the words that Jesus taught were extraordinary indeed. As a matter of fact, it says there uh, near the end that Jesus taught unlike their teachers, the people they had been accustomed to. He taught as one who had authority. That's kind of the transitionary verse into what we're moving into now because not only did he teach as if he had first-person authority, he then went out and began to perform miracles to show, to make evidence that the things that he was saying were very, very true. It's the word of God, the power of God, uh, with signs and wonders following. And I kind of wonder if that's what he wants to do among us. As a matter of fact, I don't wonder at all. I know it to be true. Uh, I bet the future on this church that it's true. If God's truth and his power are not the foundation of what we're doing, then I don't know what we're doing. And I'm willing to experiment a little bit. I'm willing to test this a little bit. I'm willing to have greater expectation, more anticipation. The title of today's sermon is Anticipation. I want to use these four verses today, not only to review what happened historically, but also to inform us and instruct us on what we should be expecting to happen in current times. And I want to work through this passage. And as we see Jesus do miracles in the past, I want to believe that Jesus is going to continue to do miracles in the present, in and through our lives. And I, my prayer in all of this, there's two prayers I have in all of this for our body. The first prayer is that God would come to those who are hurting the most and do miraculous things to lift them up, to glorify himself through their weakness by making them strong. And the other um, prayer that I have in this is that somehow the skeptics among us, the cynical, those who don't believe in the power of God in this era in that way, Um, that God would knock you off your feet and humble you with his goodness and bring you along with us on this journey. And this will not be something your pastor can manufacture. I'm not one of those TV guys. Like every time I pray for somebody and they get healed, which hasn't been that much, hasn't been nearly enough, uh, I'm like the most shocked person in the world that it actually happened. So uh, that's not my nature. That's not my character But I really do believe that this church is to be a church of God's word and of his spirit, which must mean we must also be a church where his power is demonstrated and acts of loving kindness. I think it's essential that these things begin to happen among us so that we grow physically as a body and that that growth is built on something that is true, substantive and real and from God so that our faith grows as a body. And we get closer to God so that our joy grows as a body. And, and, and I think it's high time, especially in the American church and in the days that are coming ahead, 
with all that's going to come against us, because I believe that people are going to war with God's truth unlike ever before, I think it's going to be very, very important that as we uh, espouse God's truth, we also at the same time prove that truth with power. I think it's absolutely essential, not just for our own well-being, but absolutely essential for our testimony, for our witness to the world, that we begin to experience the salvation that we proclaim in, in acts of healing, in supernatural provision, and increased and improved mental health by the power of the Holy Spirit, improved emotions, restored relationships, in whatever category uh, or that we exist in and that we're struggling in, to see the power of God, the love of God, the creativity of God, the energy of God, the resurrection power of God dispensed to us in those ways. So we only have four verses today, but I bet you I can make it a nice, good, long sermon, even though we don't have that much text. If if I try really hard. Only four verses, and this is historical, but as I said, I think there's some information in here that's very, very important, and I think there's a way of looking at this very quick, short passage that I bet many of us have read over many times. Um, it, it, I bet there's some things in here that we miss, that we've read over, we've read it too fast, we haven't sat down, we haven't thought about it, we haven't read between the lines, we haven't looked deeply into it, so let's try to do a little bit of that t together today, because uh, the faith we need to receive the power um, that God has for us, grace uh, through faith, comes from hearing the Word of God. And so let us focus on the substance of our faith, the Word of God. We don't have faith in whatever we want to have faith in. We have faith in what God says to us and that we believe. So in chapter 8, verse 1, the very first sentence, it says, When Jesus came down from the mountainside. This is coming off of the Sermon on the Mount. They had just said, wow, man, there is nobody who has ever taught with as, which, as much eloquence, as much power, as much authority, clarity, like we all under, kind of understand what he's saying at our own various levels. It's, wow, it's powerful, it's profound. We know that we got to go back and look at it. It's deeper than even what we can consume right now. But they were enthralled by what he taught, and they had already begun to experience his miracles. And so there was some real juice around the ministry of Jesus at this time. Now, later he would say some things that were quite controversial, and a lot of people would leave him. But at this time, um, it's building up, and the crowds are large, and they're beginning to follow him. So when the Jesus came down from the mountainside, large crowds followed him with lots of energy, lots of enthusiasm, a sense of anticipation. I wonder what he's going to do next. I'm also convinced that among those in the crowd, uh, there were many who believed that he truly was the Messiah. And the Messiah was a figure in, in Jewish history um, that they expected to come and to emancipate Israel and make it the great world power once again. They were thinking more along the lines of the second coming of Christ when he would come triumphantly and powerfully and in a sense politically and reestablish Israel as the supernation over all nations on planet Earth. And they wanted to be close to this power figure when that happened. And he was already beginning to show the leadership ability and the power to do that, something supernatural from God, but they did not really fully understand the nature of the first coming. And so I do think there were some of those among him as well, but I also think there were just people there like, hey, like the last time we were with him, he fed a bunch of us a bunch of food, and like my friend got his arm healed, and like they were just, you know, wanting to see uh, what he was going to do and maybe even what he was going to say next. In the midst of that, a man with leprosy came, and knelt before him and said, I mean, this, this sentence just blew me away this week. I mean, th what God taught me from this sentence and the way I have interpreted it, and I bet you have interpreted it, and maybe, uh, maybe we have interpreted it wrong. Uh, a man came and knelt before him and said, he had leprosy, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Now, I don't know about you, but I've always read that as a statement of faith with equivocation. And I've always read it like this guy had weak faith. He had uninformed faith. That God was merciful, and we know God's going to heal him. It wouldn't be in here if he didn't. I mean, <laughs> I doubt it would have gotten recorded if he said, if you're willing, you can make me clean. And Jesus goes, yeah, I'll just, no, no thanks. And he moved on. That probably wouldn't have made it into the pages. But uh, So we know where this is going. And it seems like maybe the guy should have had more faith. He should have been more emphatic in his faith. And he, said, and he should have said, Jesus, I know you can and I know you will make me clean. But actually, I think that equivocation is wiser than we think it is. And, and let us think about it. Let's think about why. And, and, and let me talk to you about myself personally when I approach God when I have a need. 
and, and maybe this is true for you too, I never doubt that he can. And most Christians I know doubt, never doubt his ability. He has the strength. He has the ability. What we doubt is, does he want to? Does he desire to? Does he will to make me better or to work in this circumstance or to help me out of this situation? We know he can, but what we don't know is, does he will? And I actually don't think at the very beginning of our journey when we're seeking God for a breakthrough in our life, for victory in our life, the words we love to use in the church, for power in our lives, um, that that's unhealthy. Because as you heard me say a couple of weeks ago in a sermon, the greatest mistakes I think I have ever made in my faith is not when I was cautious and not when I was humble, but when I was presumptuous. And I presume to know based on maybe even a promise that I didn't clearly understand what God willed to do with me and even when he willed to do it. So you got this guy, and he hadn't been around Jesus that long. He has leprosy. Let's assume he's had leprosy for a long time, and and he hasn't been around Jesus, but he probably believes in God. He's a Jew. He believes in God. And he probably went to the temple and washed himself in the water, and had he probably went through whatever, you know, ceremony existed for you know someone to be healed whatever liturgy formal or informal existed he probably had faith that God could but God never had healed him I'm I'm speculating I'm reading between the lines and so he comes to Jesus and he's like look man I've seen what you had to say I've seen what you've done I know the power of God I know how you've worked in other people's lives yet you've never shown up in my life this way but I know you can if you will what I don't know is, will you? And, and, and I would say to this day, I think that's actually a pretty healthy choice. Now, once we know the will of God, then we should pray it boldly and even authoritatively in the name of Jesus. The Bible says that if we pray anything according to God's will, we know that he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, we know that we have what we ask of him. And this guy's like, hey, I want to be able to pray with just that kind of uh, energy and that kind of focus. But I don't know. And so when I'm going through a a trouble or a storm, or one of you guys are going through difficulty, the first thing I do before I say anything, before I really pray anything in such a way as to ask uh, for the outcome, is I ask to know the will of God. I mean, if grace comes through faith, which comes through God's word, our formula that you're going to hear here a million times, because that's how it works, right? That's why God's word is the star of the show. That's why a, a church that wants to see the power of God has to be, got to be honed into the word of God. In the scriptures, of course, and as the Holy Spirit opens up the scriptures and speaks to us, and even prompts us and speaks to us personally with his still silent voice, we need a word from God, a prompting from God, a vision from God, a dream from God, some sense of what God wants to do in our life. Then we can make informed prayers. Then we can even boldly declare some things in Jesus' name and see that they happen. But this is, to me, a wise equivocation. I know you can, but will you? The first thing I look for whenever I'm going through something difficult or somebody I know is going through something difficult is a promise from God. I need a promise. I need hope. Now, I know that you're good, and I know that you care about me, and, and I, obviously, I don't doubt that you can, and I don't doubt in some sense that you will, but I'm not sure that you will according to my will. Right? In other words, I might be broke, and I might be praying for a promotion at work, and God's like, yeah, I don't want you to have that job. I want you to have this job instead. I might be praying through for a br- breakthrough in a relationship, if not me because I'm married, but you might be praying for a breakthrough in a relationship with a boyfriend or a girlfriend, and God's like, yeah, no not who I have for you. And so we need to be able to pray according to his will. We know that he can, but does he will? What is the promise? What should I put my hope in? What is the overriding word? It can be even abstract. It could be in the form of a vision. But what is God telling me or informing me that he has for me in the future as a remedy to this situation? That's one thing I ask. And then the other thing I ask for is perspective. And perspective has a lot to do with how do I approach this, how patient should I be, how much should I persevere, and what are my instructions, what is the correction that goes along with the promise. In other words, 
I might be going through something really difficult, and God makes a promise. He says, you can hope in this, you can hold on to this, but there's something attached to it. The reason that you got into this circumstance in the first place is that you sinned. And, and I want to see some repentance. If I bless you out of this, if I change your life, if I change your circumstances, and I do it quickly, and I do it immediately, and, I, and you don't receive correction in the midst, then I'm only setting you up for a bigger fall further down the road. So if there is sin attached to this, I need to know what the sin is because the sin, is my, the sin directs me towards repentance, which is my instructions to participate in the will of God. I mean, it's, not, it's one thing to stand there and say, I have faith, I have faith, I have faith. God's going to bless me. God's going to take care of me. God's going to bring me out of this circumstance. God's going to bring healing. God's going to bring a new job. God is going to fix this relation. It's, that's fine. That's probably true. But what is attached to it? Because the words don't simply come in beautiful vision. They come in the form of correction and instruction. And it's by grace, through faith, in those words... That brings salvation, but faith without action is dead, right? So that's one thing I got to look at. The other thing I got to recognize is that many times, I would say almost every time I ask for God for some kind of breakthrough in my life, I know there's going to be a waiting period. As a matter of fact, the further I go in my journey with Christ, the more I have to go through long, difficult periods to get to the next place. And, And I need a sense of that. I have to say, Lord, is this one of those things you're using to build my character? And I'll be honest with you, for me, it's always, yes, there must be something really wrong with my character because I am always in the middle of a character test. And then I go, oh, okay, well, I have the promise. I know God's going to come through. I know he's going to come through one day in some form, maybe not the form I want, but I trust in that. But I also have to consider it pure joy when I face trials of many kinds because I know the testing of my faith, my belief in his word and what he said, produces perseverance, and perseverance must finish its work so that I'm mature and complete and not lacking anything. Beautiful James 1 language here, so that when God brings the blessing, when he brings the breakthrough, the increased power, the increased authority, the help that I need, the wealth that I might need, I feel like a prosperity teacher, but whatever it is, the breakthrough in my relationship, um, I have the character to contain that and do what he wants with it. You know? Many pastors, this would be a normal thing. We, want, we all want big churches. And I'm actually quite content with whatever size church God gives me at this point. Too many years of trying and too many years of being disappointed. And I'm just like, I've learned contentment in that. Um, but that's something a pastor would want. That's something uh, a mom and dad might want or a lot of kids. I got four. Be careful what you ask for. They're wonderful. Every single one of them. They're blessings. But, you know, be careful. Maybe you want more money. Maybe you want more responsibility at work. But you know what? If God gives you these things, to whom much is given, much is demanded. And if you don't have the character to contain the blessing, then the blessing isn't a blessing. The blessing becomes a curse. And the Bible says when God blesses, he blesses and he adds no trouble to it. So when we pray, when we bow down before Christ, and when we ask him to bring transformation, to bring power, to bring change, we need to be a lot like this leper. And we need to say, hey, if it's your will... And maybe that was another way of him saying, if it's your time, if the timing is right, if I'm ready and you're ready and everything, the confluence of those events are all ready, I know you can make me well. The other reason sometimes God tarries in, in bringing a breakthrough in our life and giving us the things that we're asking for, it, it has nothing to do with us. It has nothing to do with our character. It has nothing to do with sin. It just has to do with his sovereign timing and even his glory. And actually, I think that's what has been going on in this leper's life. We're going to read at the, on the very last verse, not only is Jesus going to heal this man from leprosy, but in the instructions he gives him in verse 4, he's going to show him the purpose, the redemption of the pain that he has suffered. And it wasn't about him. It wasn't about sin. It might have been about character, but mostly it was about healing him at just the right time, to lift him up at just the right time, to glorify God and to affirm the coming of the kingdom of heaven. It was a glorious purpose for his suffering. And so sometimes that's, that's the case uh, as well. And so I actually think this equivocated statement of faith is actually quite informative. This isn't just a retelling of what happened historically. I mean, Jesus did not rebuke him for coming to him in this way. Jesus actually met him right where he was, and it was the right time. Jesus reached out his hand and touched the man, and he said, I am willing. Be clean. 
And immediately, I love the word immediately. I wish that would happen more when I pray. But immediately, and probably after years of this man praying, right? But now immediately at coming to Jesus, he was cleansed of his leprosy. Now, uh, I think there's something to talk about here a little bit. Jesus touched the man. That was one point of contact. And he spoke to the man and said, be clean. And so where was the transfer of power? Was it in the touch or was it in the word? Right? Now, clearly, if Jesus touches you, that's powerful. Power in the touch. And Scripture teaches us that when we're praying for someone and praying for their healing, that we should lay hands on the sick and pray for them. And they'll be that point of contact, that point of touch is incredibly important, but it's not the most important thing. The most important thing is the Word. The Word of God never comes back void. It always accomplishes the purpose for which it is sent out. Now, how do we know it's the Word of God? Because it's the Son of God. He, he prays first person with authority, without equivocation, used in a different way here, be clean, and he is clean. You know why? Because he is the, the Son is the exact radiance of the Father's glory. He's the exact representation of his being. When you hear from the Son, you hear from the Father. When you see the Son, you see the Father. At the end of the Gospel, one of, the, uh, one of his disciples said, Hey, Jesus, like show us the Father. He said, Man, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. The two are one. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. The two are one. There's never an ounce of, sh- uh, of light in between them. They're identical. And so Jesus himself has the authority. When he speaks, it is immediately done, even in human form. The touch was powerful. The touch was good. Many times Jesus used touch in, in his acts of healing, but the word is what's essential. And I say that to you to say that wherever you are, whoever you are, whatever the case may be, if you're not here, if we have a pandemic and you can't come to the altar and the elders can't lay hands on you, you're watching online, you're sitting in your room by yourself, that's okay because the touch really isn't the thing. The thing is the word, which is why we seek it with all of our heart. And it's also got to be a word that literally does come from the will of God. He's got to say, I will be clean. It can't be, I think he said, or I'm going to say in his name he said. He actually has to say it. The power is in the word. And the good news is, from the Father, through the blood of the Son, by the power of the Holy Spirit, working through the Scriptures, working through the apostles, the prophets, and the teachers, the evangelists, the ministers that God has given us to this very day, working through the priesthood of all believers among us. God is sending and continuing to send his word among humanity up to this very time. This power should and does continue to exist uh, uh, through us to this very day. Now, Jesus, when he spoke authoritatively, he he spoke first person. He didn't equip. He just said, be clean. Um, But in Scripture, we are taught, and the example is laid out by the apostles, that when we pray for someone and we want them to be healed, that we pray in the name of Jesus under his authority, be clean, as we are inspired to do so by his Holy Spirit. In other words, we can't just put his name on our desire. But as the Spirit of Christ lands upon the servant of Christ, and God gives us a sense, a phrase, an idea, a vision of what he has to say, then in Jesus' name, under his authority, because we are connected to him by the blood and through the Holy Spirit, we have been given the authority to do that. Now, this is really interesting to me because um, I feel like God is changing the way that I pray about things like this. Now, the first thing I do, I told you, is I I want to know the will of God. Give me a sense. What is the promise, Lord? And, and the instructions and perspective. Is there sin that we need to deal with? Is there, uh, is there just character that needs to develop? Is this one of those things we're going to have to hold on to and stay strong in the spirit on? Is there, are we waiting on circumstances to happen? Is this a part of your sovereignty? What is it? What are your will? What is your instructions? I, I want information. You know, the first stage is that intelligence gathering. Then the next stage is to begin to pray the will of God. And what I have found Uh, to be true, and I've read this in some books lately, that actually begging God for the answer to prayer that he has already promised you is not the way to pray. And some of us sound like country music songs, like a broken record of moaning and groaning before God and waiting for an answer. And he's like, look, no, I've given you the answer. And the power isn't in my touch. The power is in 
my word. And so it's time, and it may take time, but it's time to begin to declare that word in Jesus' name once we know that we have it. To declare it. You know, I mean, the apostles, they didn't come up to a person who needed to be healed and kneel down and beg God to heal them. He, they walked up and they said, in the name of Jesus Christ, pick up your mat and walk. A guy came to him one day, couldn't walk, he needed some money. He asked for money. Like any preacher, they didn't have any money. They said, you know, silver and gold we do not have, but what we do have we give you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Get up and walk. They didn't beg God. That's the power. That's the authority of Scripture. These are the things that we need to grow in our knowledge of because I really do uh, believe that this is how God wants to work among us. Again, uh, the critical thing here, so that you don't think I've turned into some kind of prosperity word of faith teacher, because that's what I feel like right now. I'm a little uncomfortable. Is that we have honed into the will of God. That we are inspired and we know the will of God. That he has given us something that is truly from him, from heaven, that we're responding to. I believe when the apostles walked by and the guy asked for money, they had walked by a lot of people begging for a lot of things a lot of times. And they didn't answer every prayer every time because God didn't show them that the time was right. God didn't show them faith was there. But at this particular point, at this particular time, it all came together and the Holy Spirit prompted and it happened. That's what's happening behind the scenes. One time here um, in Virginia, um, I, don't re- I don't remember the exact details, but I was prompted from the platform to say something to really build expectation in someone that healing was going to happen. And I don't remember what I said. It could have been through communion. A lot of times it comes on to me in communion. I really feel like sometimes when people receive the elements that signify the body and blood of Christ given for us, that when they receive them, in a sense, the sacrament is mingled with the Holy Spirit, and there's a potential for healing there, right? Some, it may have been that, but I don't remember. I said something, the word went out, and somebody in our congregation received it. They knew that it was from them, and then uh, weeks later, they came up to me, and they want to say, you know, that day you said that. The next day, I went to the doctor. The tumor was gone. I've been healed of cancer. And I didn't name it, I didn't claim it, I didn't even know where the word was going, but it came from God, and it landed, and it, and it happened in just the way it should. Another time, a more minor miracle, I was in California, and uh, I, was, I had just set up communion, and I went backstage for a minute to pray, and then come back out and to um, re- serve the elements so that we could receive the elements together. And I had that sense, that prompting, that as somebody received these elements, they were going to receive some healing, and um, and, and, and I felt like maybe even more than one. I just, I mean, I was strongly impressed by the Holy Spirit to do that. And when I did that, um, a week later, a few days later, a lady sent an email and she said, look, I had just gotten out of surgery. I, was, I had wounds and I was in a lot of pain. And instantly the pain was gone. I didn't name it or claim it. I just kind of went with the Spirit and he did it. Another time, you guys know this story well, I was in Africa, this is like the most amazing one ever, I was in Africa and the pastor asked me to pray for his son who had malaria, I mean he was deadly sick with malaria, we went in there and I looked at him and I went, oh man, that guy's in trouble, and we began to pray for him and we began to pray in the old country music song way where we're begging God to heal him, and then something happened in the midst of those prayers, and as I was praying for him, my hand shot up and I began to speak more like a prophecy than a prayer, and I don't, I mean, I'm uncomfortable with this, it just happened. And I was foolish enough to go on the record and say, this is like a Thursday, we were coming back on Sunday. I was foolish enough to say, by the time we get back here Sunday, he will be healed. And the Holy Spirit did that. God spoke it through me. And the reason we know that is because that's exactly what happened. By the way, Friday and Saturday were the two longest days of my life, knowing I had to go back to that church Sunday. And if I wasn't right, then the, when the prophet tells a lie, you have to stone him. So... They don't think they do that in America, but in Africa, they might. I mean, they're really serious about the word. They, they follow the word to the letter of the law. So those are the kind of inspiration. That, those are the kind of things we need. Um, the other day, I was with a family in our church going through something. And, and before I went and met with them, they're going through a hard thing. And before I went and met with them, I, I wanted a sense. What is? Give me the promise and give me a perspective. I don't want to go and minister to somebody that, where I haven't heard from you, Lord. I don't want to go in there and make it up. I don't want to go in there and lead them into false. I don't know. I mean, I need something. I mean, real is everything to me. And uh, I went out to my battlefield where I like to walk and run and and, and be with God. And and God spoke. He filled me up with inspiration. He filled me up with hope. He filled me up with some of the kind of ideas that I've spoken here today. And he gave me so much for them and for me with them. Uh, and, And I went to their house and I began to talk to them and 
I was like this. I started being a preacher for like two people. And so um, it was really awkward. And the man, the man got up. It was funny. He said, the man got up and he had to go to the bathroom. He said, I'll be right back, Kenneth Copeland. He called me Kenneth Copeland, who's like the grandfather of the Word of Faith movement. And I laughed so hard. I'm like, I'm so glad you said that because that means you're listening to me because that's exactly what I sound like. But the big difference is that Kenneth Copeland, that whole movement, the mistake they make is they move in presumption very often and lead people disillusioned. You know, the, the, the era in approaching God this way is presumption. We can't overemphasize that. One of the things that I think that movement does is it, it, it teaches people to ask for whatever they want, like God is a genie. And in James, we know that doesn't work. The Bible says you do not have because you do not ask God. Well, we're not going to make that mistake anymore. We're going to ask God. And when you ask, you don't receive because you ask that you might take whatever you get and spend it on your own pleasures. I don't build up self or selfishness. Doesn't mean that God doesn't meet our needs and even give us some of what we desire, but he doesn't accept selfish prayers. And I think the, the fatal part of that movement is people are asking for airplanes and cars and jewelry rather than what they need to take care of their family and to perpetuate the gospel. And we know that the Lord is just not into that. I mean, of course, he gives uh, riches as he desires, and some people are given more than they ever asked for, but that is never, ever to be the focus on our prayers. I think that is a fatal flaw in that movement. Another flaw is that sin is underemphasized. I mean, many times we're going through what we're going through because we're just, we've got things in our life, we've got habits in our life, we've got perpetual broken things in our life that keep us from a place where God can give us more power and authority because when we're broken, we'll just use it to destroy ourselves and destroy others, right? That's that has to be dealt with. Sin has to be dealt with. Another error of the movement is that they're not into the full counsel of God. I mean, we have to go through three chapters of the Sermon on the Mount and look at everything that God has to say to be completely informed in the Word for the Spirit and the power and the signs and the wonders to follow. We have to have a sense that sometimes God is building our character. One of the big mistakes of the movement is that they demand instant results, and if you don't get instant results, then you must not have enough faith, when actually, I think according to Scripture, those of us who have to persevere and suffer the longest sometimes have the most faith, not the least faith. And it makes people feel like they're second-class citizens because it's not God's sovereign right time, or, you know, it's just, there's just a lot of flaws to that. So I don't want you, I, I, if you think I sound like that, that's good because you're listening and there is some truth there that we need to hold on to because they're teaching and preaching things from the Scripture. But I also don't want you to think that we're going to fall into those traps and make those kind of errors because I don't believe that. That is true uh, either. Anyway, moving on, with our, moving on with our sermon. Verse 4. See, I told you I could make a full deal out of this. Then Jesus said to him, Four verses. Can you believe how informative it is? By the way, next week we get to do the faith of the centurion, which is one of my favorite passages in all of Scripture. Just so you know, be excited to come back next week. Then Jesus said to him, See that you don't tell anyone. Be subtle. Be low-key. Go and make sure that this isn't a momentary moment, that this is real. Go you show yourself to the priest. And offer the gift Moses commanded, this is what happened when you were healed according to the law, as a testimony to them. And, and to me, this is the redemption. This is the why God allowed him to suffer, to suffer as long as he did. It wasn't because of his sin. It wasn't because maybe he didn't have enough character. It wasn't that he didn't have enough faith. It wasn't for all the reasons that sometimes we may think that we're suffering. I bet, his, I bet everybody in his family and all of his friends and all the people around him looked at him like, man, what kind of sin did you get into? God gave you leprosy, and he won't even take it off. I bet he was treated like a second-class citizen, like something was wrong with him by people around him all the time. By the way, that continues to happen to this day. Don't you know it? When you're going through a hard time, people will show you sympathy. They'll show you pity. But they also look at you like, what, are you dumb? Are you in sin? Pick yourself up. Quit feeling sorry. I mean, you know, it, you, people just, we despise that which we perceive to be weak. This guy had lived being despicable, being an outcast, not being touched, not being around people, not being loved, not being esteemed for a really long time. He had been ostracized. And the purpose of it all was not what was wrong with him, but what was right with him. And the fact that God wanted to glorify himself and through his son, through this act, through this man. And, and immediately he's like, oh, wait a minute. The reason I have leprosy that he allowed it, he didn't cause it, but that he allowed it, 
and he didn't remove it from me sooner was because he wanted to use me to go and bring the religious elite who are supposed to be experts in the law and experts in the coming of the Messiah and bring them humbly to their knees. He did this as a testimony to them, and I would extend to you as a testimony to us. Now, think of the honor of this man. Wherever this gospel would be told for the next 2,000, 3,000, however many years it is, he would be a part of the story. He was written in to the story as a testimony for generations to come. It was about the timing of God. It was about the sovereignty of God. It was about glorifying God. It wasn't about what was wrong with him. It was about God honoring him and lifting him up and using him to do something extraordinary and to do something great. Uh, Sometimes that's just the case, and that's why we wait, because at just the right time, God is going to reveal his power through us in a way to bless as a testimony uh, to many people around us. So, you know, don't ever give up. Go seek the promise, get the perspective and then persevere. I, I really don't think, um, I, I told somebody yesterday, I don't think for quite some time, we're going to experiment. This is just, by the way, for Virginia. It's not for California. And this is not a condemnation on churches that advertise. I think uh, we've advertised, we've reached out, we've seen people come to the church through our outreach and, uh, and fall in love with Christ and have powerful encounters. There's just absolutely nothing wrong with that. That might even be a positive and good thing to do, a scriptural thing to do to spread the gospel as God has told us to go and do that. And advertising might be um, one of the ways to do that. But right now, for this body, in this place, in this space, in this time, we're going to experiment. Now, I mean, we have a website, and I think we're using YouTube. I think we have like eight people watching us on YouTube, so we got that big thing going for us. And um, we have a sign in front of the building, and we'll, of course, put an A-frame out so people can find us if they're looking for us. But we're not going to do anything extraordinary to advertise this church. What we're going to do is we're going to focus on, drill down on the Word of God and believe in the power of the Spirit of God to accompany His Word, which is the Spirit too, and, the, and, and to do wonderful things among us and out of what He does in and through us as He did in and through this leper and beyond in every category of our life and that the infectiousness of that in a positive way among us, spreading out to all of our relationships, friends, family, neighbors, right? Investing, inviting, we won't stop doing. Uh, we're going to believe that's how he's going to grow this church. That's what he wants to do, th- that experiment, so that one day maybe we advertise and one day we do all these other things again to draw people in. But we know at the foundation this church was built on God's word, on God's truth, and on his spirit, which is his power. So I say to you, you have a wonderful opportunity and responsibility in this, in this body, and that is to come with clean hands and a pure heart and open heart, rid yourself of the cynical spirit, the unbelieving spirit, the spiritual lethargy, repent of your sin, make your sensitive spirit sensitive to the Holy Spirit, and be expectant and anticipate God to move. Let's stand there. He says we don't have because we don't ask. Let's ask. Let's make ourselves available. Glorify yourself through this mess, Lord. Pastor Brian and the flock that exists all around him, come expectantly, come openly. And, and maybe uh, on one of these Sunday mornings, maybe this Sunday morning, it's your moment, and immediately Jesus will speak the word through someone or powerfully and visibly by the Holy Spirit, and you'll be healed or you'll be restored or whatever he has for you will at least be unleashed and begin to happen in your life. Maybe it'll be your moment. Even if it's not your moment, maybe he'll bring the word. You know, I can't, I can't see you at home, even though I tell you that I can see you through the lens. I'm kidding. I can't see you, but I can see my, my congregation here. And the one thing that we did here in error is we didn't put pens and paper out. I guess we're afraid you're going to get coronavirus from, you know, touching the paper. Because you need to write. You need to read the word. You need to underline the word. You need to highlight the word. You need to take notes during the sermon. And in any given moment, as the Holy Spirit speaks to you, you need to write the word of God. That is our resource. It is the most powerful thing. You can't please God without faith. Therefore, you can't please God without a word that you put faith in, right? So words, even if it's not your moment, it might very well be and probably is the moment for God to give you the the promise, the perspective, the correction, the instruction, 
uh, the sense that this is a character thing and we need to get ready for this in the future are just the tender mercies that come along with, hey man, I know you, I see you, I love you, this isn't about you, it's about me, this is about my sovereignty, this is about my glory, at the right time, at the perfect time, I'm going to come through for you. Whatever the case may be, you got to start getting these words, you got to start getting this perspective, you got to write it down. God will begin to speak it over and over again like a drumbeat and let that word be conceived in your heart and just at the right time, in the right place, among us or even beyond, God's going to come through. And let our reputation in this community be the place where they are serious, they are real, they are drilled down into God's word, into God's truth, and power follows that. Let it, that be our legacy. I really do believe that we have been very, very good on the word, but we have not been good enough on the spirit or the power aspect of this. We need to not presume upon more, but expect God for more, and I think that's exactly what he wants us to do. And so that's going to be the direction. That's going to be the way we go as we move forward in the future. And right here, right now today, we can't open an altar. We can't lay hands on you and pray for you. The governor will put us in jail. Um, many of you are online and you're at home. But right here, right now today, with this prayer, because the power is in the word, right? We're going to ask and we're going to believe and we're going to begin to receive. Let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, we love you. We praise you. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your spirit also. They are one and the same. You do not cause us to open up a book of dead literature and read about the past in a way that might be mentally or intellectually edifying. You cause us to read. You draw us into a living word that sears our heart and pierces our heart and imparts into our heart faith in your spirit, we have a dynamic encounter with you through your word, through the teaching of your word, in the counsel of your people, and in the company of your people. Thank you and praise you that we have a living faith. Thank you for the words of the Bible that create expectation and anticipation that you can and you will move in our life. Lord, we're tired of talking about salvation. We're tired of boasting about a salvation. We're tired of waiting on a salvation until we die. We want to begin to experience our salvation on earth even before we fully enter into the kingdom of heaven. We want to glorify you through signs and wonders, power and authority, and acts of loving kindness that come in us and work through us even now. We want to do it for your glory, and we want it, frankly, Lord, because we have needs. We're hurting. And we don't want to hurt this way anymore. So on behalf of myself and this precious congregation here in Virginia and beyond online, we come before you with clean hands and a pure heart. We confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed and things that we've done and things that we should have done that we didn't do. We haven't loved you with our whole heart. We haven't loved our neighbor as ourselves. We're sorry and we humbly repent. We absolutely need to clear our conscience before you, Lord, so that we can be sensitive to your Holy Spirit and, heal, and hear your word. We know that is the basis of everything for, for us, through the scriptures and beyond. I ask, dear God, as I uh, bring this congregation before you today, that we would have uh, open minds and open hearts, that we would have faith, and, and that we wouldn't be cynical. Maybe our faith is little. Maybe it's shallow right now. That's just where we are, Lord. But I pray that it would be sincere and childlike. And not cynical. And not skeptical. I pray that we would open our heart. And for some of us, it's just all the faith in the world that we believe that we even could hear you. And, and I feel like you're saying to, to those among us who think, man, I, I don't hear you the way Pastor Brian hears you. And you're saying, well, he doesn't hear me as clear as you think. He has to work at it. He's a disciple. It takes discipline. And you're, you're my sheep, know my voice. And you're my sheep, and you know my voice. And if you hear Brian, and, and, and you hear what he's saying, and you understand what he's saying, then you're hearing me, and you're understanding what I'm saying. I'm working through him, and I'll work beyond him by the power of the Holy Spirit. I want you to speak to your precious people, Lord. Let them know that they can hear your word from the Scriptures and beyond. Pray that we would have the discipline, we would have the wisdom to recognize that when we have a word from God, we have a treasure. That we need to write it down, that we need to hide it, that we need to hold on to it. We've got to be careful who we even show it to because they might steal our faith in it. Send your word, dear God. Give us your promise. Have, have us write it down in a journal or a piece of paper and not lose us. Give us perspective. If there's sin in our life, we need to not just confess but turn away from Give us the inspiration to do that. We can't turn away from sin on our own. We need the power of the Holy Spirit 
to cause us to turn. We can confess, but if you don't forgive and then fill us with your Holy Spirit, we don't have the power to turn and walk another way. Give us a sense that uh, where we are in the grand scheme of things, is this something that we're going to have to work through over time, that we need to persevere? Is this something where we're waiting on you to move for your sovereignty and your glory? Whatever the case may be, Lord, give us your word. Give us your promise. Give us perspective. Get us to the place where we don't just say we know that you can. We know that you will. And we even know what your will is. And now instead of begging you, we're going to proclaim in your name what you've already promised. Do that work over this church. Lord, you have shown me the word you have sent me for this body. The answer to my prayer for this body and how you want to establish it is that you want to work through your word and you want to work through your spirit. You want to work uh, through truth and you want to work through power. And so I boldly proclaim in the name of Jesus that Monterey Church will be a place of power and be a place of healing. That you will, you will impart power upon this church and we will not simply be people who speak the word and talk about the word and talk about salvation but have empty shirts and no power. We will be a powerful people. Not a prideful people, but a humble people and a powerful people for your glory, for your fame, to bring people into a legitimate relationship with you. Lord, I pray right now, I just feel, I just sense that one of the first places you want to move is in our marriages. Between a husband and wife, at the the center of, of the nuclear family at the nucleus of a nuclear family is a husband and a wife and i perceive that's where for some of us you're going to work and you're going to move first and then everything around that will come into order and so i speak a word in the name of jesus Uh, husbands and wives be healed husbands love your wives as christ loved the church and gave himself for her and wives submit to your husband as unto the Lord. I pray for order, for peace, for love, for joy and respect in our households, in our marriages. Begin at that nuclear level, dear God, in the nucleus, and may it spread out from there. Come and speak, continue to speak, even after my words, even after my prayer. Do a wonderful thing among your people. We can't wait to start hearing the great reports. Give yourself glory. Make yourself famous through Monterey Church, through real truth and real power. Amen.